I'm not a big fan of you doing graphs in Excel, but let's, this is an interesting data set. Real big swings in net income, and this is something else, right? Okay, so NVIDIA had a monster 2021, while Intel uh, only grew 1%. Oh my gosh. Intel spent $11 billion in R&D back then, when AMD was planning its products, with 5% of the spend. Sad. 20% discount's not enough. It's weird because like, if you look at AMD and NVIDIA, they're still relatively small players compared to Intel. Intel's share, market share of that, has been 80%, then 75, then 65, then 59. <laughs> Brutal. We are an industry leader, man. They were the industry leader. Have a positive effect on business society and the planet. It's always funny when these really big companies that used to be even bigger, they're still really focused on ESG because they, they're, they still have that shadow of the former self. NVIDIA doesn't talk like that. NVIDIA's like, yeah, we're, we're here to make money, man. Oh, they can make a comeback. They just, like you said, need to really simplify their, their company. Let's dive into Intel. All right, so the way I look at it is I start with the stock price. I look at the number of shares outstanding, which uh, you can find in a few different places. One place to find it is just the 10K. The most recent 10 filing, whether it's a 10K or a 10Q. It's usually on like the first page. The way the SEC loads these things, even a super fast computer like mine, it gets a little messed up, so it's not a great system. All right, usually there's a shares outstanding here. It is 4.137 million, so 4.4137 million, so 4.137 billion shares outstanding. So market cap's 112 billion, which is a fraction of like NVIDIA's. It's funny. NVIDIA used to be a pimple on Intel's butt. Now they're bigger than Intel. I'll be uploading this model on my GitHub. All my files are available on my GitHub totally for free as a courtesy to all you folks. So we need to look up their cash and debt. That's going to be on something called the balance sheet, which is one of the three financial statements. If you're not familiar with financial statements, you're about to get a world-class introduction. Financial statements are the life of, of the markets, the language of the markets, the lingua franca. You cannot understand business without understanding financial statements. Uh, the three financial statements tell basically the complete picture, the whole story of any company. You can encapsulate uh, the entire business in those three statements. 10K is the annual report, so it's very detailed. It's got a lot of just, uh, just a ton of data and we're looking for the three financial statements. Sometimes it's sequestered in a separate file. Sometimes it isn't. We can also get some abridged financial statements for the press release. Sometimes there's, there's they're not abridged at all. Sometimes they are. All right, here's here's the uh, here's the income statement. So this uh, the income statement uh, tracks period results. That means for a year or for a quarter or for whatever. Balance sheet is a snapshot statement. It tracks. Uh, it tells you the account values at a specific date. So it's like a it's like a camera that takes a photo, and this is what we wanted. We want the most updated cash balance of the company, and that is for available each quarter. It's like thirty four billion, roughly. You gotta include anything that's kind of a liquid instrument, in my opinion. So those two and this one look liquid, and now we gotta look at the debt. The debt is four billion here, and then thirty seven billion there. Companies use debt for all kinds of reasons, stock buybacks, etc. So that's not necessarily a bad thing or anything. Okay, so those are the big six. Uh, it's 112 billion, billion market cap, 120 billion enterprise value. If you don't know what an enterprise value is, it's a really important concept. If you struggle with that, um, you're not going to make it very far in investing. Um, take your time to learn and understand what it is. It's basically the market cap adjusted for the net cash, kind of what you're paying for the business, if that makes sense. All right, so now let's look at the um, income statement. We're looking at Intel. All right, so let's go back to the income statement because it tells the story of, of the company. And you can see that the revenue, which is the sales of their product, has gone down. Um, quite a lot, actually. They dropped 20% this year. 
and they only grew 1% in uh, 2021. So it's pretty interesting. So let's look at gross margin. Gross margin is the cost, basically the, the revenue after cost that gets sold. So it's kind of a, what's left after you deduct what it took to make the product you've actually sold. And you can look at it as on a percentage basis. So I'm gonna look at that on a percentage basis and see how that tracks. It's kind of hard to eyeball that, you know? <clears throat> Maybe there's some savant out there that can eyeball it, but I can't. So it looks like 43%. So as their sales went down, their margin dropped. That's kind of like a concept called deleveraging. Now they have some other expenses. Uh, R&D is their major expense. It looks like marketing, selling an administrator or marketing general administrator is actually their smaller cost. And that's funny because I was looking at NVIDIA and Texas Instruments and that they all kind of work similarly. These semiconductor companies don't really need to advertise. It's kind of amazing. They just make their chips and they sell. And that's it. You know, there's no, there's no big marketing push or anything like that. So they're pretty, they turn out to be pretty profitable companies. Uh, although Intel in this year was not very profitable, uh, at least according to the income statement. We're gonna look at the cash flow statement, it might tell a different story. So Intel's costs went up and up even though their revenue went down. In fact, you can see their costs rose dramatically over the last two or three years, but their uh, revenue has dropped a bit. So it's a bit, a bit strange, but again, this could be a function of, uh, just a function of uh, accounting. We're not gonna include equity investment gains because that's typically not uh, a recurring item. It's kind of a gap, non-gap thing. Uh, gap is generally accepted accounting principles, G-A-A-P. And we kind of prefer non-gap numbers when possible, although we want to understand the difference between gap and non-gap. This is taxes, again, a non-GAAP concept. We have to basically adjust all this stuff for the fact that uh, GAAP is very imperfect, especially for the investor. GAAP makes a lot of sense from an accounting perspective, but from an investor, investor perspective, we have a lot of adjustments we have to make to kind of try to reflect the steady state of the business. So anyway, those are the last three years for Intel. Um, I actually kind of want to look at NVIDIA real quick just so you can get a sense for just how different these two companies are. So NVIDIA is a lot smaller revenue-wise, even though they're, they're got three, four times, three times the market cap. You know, fine. So this is fiscal year ended 23. So this is sort of going to be like full year 2022. So let's put that in. 26923. And then that's 26914 and 16675. Okay, so NVIDIA had a monster 2021, while Intel uh, only grew 1%. And then while NVIDIA stayed flat, so in a tough environment, Intel dropped 20%. So you can kind of see the, the ratio of the two closing, the gap closing. NVIDIA seems to be a lot better positioned than Intel on a product side. Um, Intel sort of always ignored the graphics chip market as well, that's a small market, but you know, obviously they messed, messed that up pretty bad. All right, let's now kind of look at uh, the cash flow statement. So the cash flow statement basically reconciles uh, the income statement, and it's pretty complicated, unfortunately. Um, but once you understand how the cash flow statement works, it really starts to reach the end of financial statement understanding, and you can sort of get to financial statement interpretation, which is a bit different. Just because you understand it doesn't mean you, you understand what it says doesn't mean you under, really understand what's going on and how to interpret it from an investor's perspective. Those are two different things. But So we're going to basically take what our model's net income is, what reported net income was, and we're going to try to sort of reconcile them, basically. I just want to glance at this. Oh, I see. They had a $4 billion one-time gain. So that's what we excluded. All right. So how did... Um, the business go from making, depending on whose definitions, if you use our definition, they made $4 billion in 2022. If you look at um, Intel's definition, they made $8 billion. But the actual cash they made, so that's the income statement, that's the reported net income. But the actual cash flow they made was $15 billion. So how do you reconcile that? 
And the same thing happened here where there's almost no difference between Intel's and ours, and here where there's very little difference between Intel's and ours. They actually had a lot more cash flow. So how did that happen? Well, there's, there's a lot of reasons there. He used this a list of all the adjustments. The biggest adjustment is depreciation, which is a non-cash expense, right? When something depreciates, you don't actually lose money. You sort of lose accounting value. And that's, that's the biggest difference. But we also have CapEx, which is a cash expense, but it's not run through the income statement. CapEx is when you buy a, a good and you capitalize it, and then you depreciate it. So that's kind of a lot of what's going on here, but let's keep looking. And theoretically, those two should kind of balance out. Like, this is like a Bob Ross attempted to say something about little trees or something like that. But happy little trees. It's happy little depreciation. And there's amortization. EBITDA is uh, a acronym that means earnings before interest taxes, depreciation, and amortization. If I didn't name my cat Trashy, it was going to name her EBITDA. So amortization is, is like depreciation just for intangible items. All right, and finally, working capital changes. So if you add all these up, they actually equal to cash flow from operations, or probably better said, this, this is how you get cash flow from operations. Let's see if it sums up. Oh, didn't work. Let's see why. Might have messed something up. Ah, I see. One minus sign makes all the difference. Okay, there it is. All right, so it sounds good that they made $15 billion, but they also had CapEx, so we gotta remove the CapEx, and that's gonna change the picture pretty dramatically. Their CapEx for the year was $24 billion, so they're to lost money this year, or 2022, last year, I guess, um, which is uh, a little frightening. Again, it was a rough year for semiconductors. But this is supposed to be like this capacity constrained industry that's supposed to be making a fortune right now. And Intel is one of the only companies that has capacity. So I don't see why they're having such a rough time. You know, the recession's not here. It's not like the economy is contracting too much. So it makes me wonder how they're going to do it in an environment that's a lot worse, right? Like semiconductor companies are very cyclical, so they're very sensitive to economic conditions. And again, Intel's sort of investing for the future, but in cyclical industries, companies do this all the time. When, when there's a supply constraint and supply is really tight, they invest a ton in factories and equipment, and then guess what happens? The opposite happens, where everybody has a ton of supply and there's all these products and they can't move them. So it's a very, like, cyclical industries are, are tough for that reason. You know, you have to really time, you know, uh, in, in the long run, it's very hard to do, time the sort of time the business cycle, which is, is, you know, as hard as it sounds. So if you if you net these two out, you kind of get a concept of, called free cash flow. And you'll get 21 billion, 11 billion, and a loss of 9 billion. So how do you think about that? You know, the traditional rookie way of doing this stuff is like an earnings multiple, right? An earnings multiple is uh, is kind of a poor man's way of, of doing uh, a DCF. And um, how do you put an earnings multiple on earnings that are this volatile? Right? If you look at like a company that has steady earnings, that's making $10 billion one year, ten and a half, eleven, et cetera, you know, you can kind of put a multiple on it. But you can't put a multiple on this, right? Because you can't you put fifteen times earnings. Well, in one year the company's worth three hundred billion. In another year it's worth one sixty billion, in another year it's worth negative. So earnings multiples tend to fail when a company has volatile earnings. So one thing we could do, kind of do is look at the average earnings. And some people call that CAPE's cyclically adjusted PE ratio. So you look at it over three years and you say, okay, they made 7.6 billion. Well, what's the PE ratio or the EV to E ratio, which is probably more important, 16 times earnings. You know, and you have to think about, well, is that reasonable or not? I don't know. But we also don't know if that's a fair, fair way to look at it because if this year is another negative year, let's say just a little smaller, now our, our average number is 4.5 billion, and 26 times is a lot different from 15 times, right? But if it's a positive 10 billion, now we're really starting to look at something that could be like a cheap stock. So I really just don't know. And part of it is if they're doing this free cash flow spend, this is kind of big one-time 
just like resizing of their footprint so they have more capacity. Uh, this would really be obscuring the earnings. And we also don't know why revenue dipped. We have to learn about the company, right? As much as the numbers tell the story of the company, we don't know every detail. We have to, we, and we have to, you know, we have to really understand the company. Even if these pictures, if these numbers looked really good, I would question it the other way and say, maybe this is a one-time gain that will reverse itself. So investing is really tricky because you have to be an expert in that industry. That's why you notice like none of these files are filled out for hardware and semiconductors because I don't really follow hardware and semiconductors. I find it fascinating, of course, but look at my biopharma. Every model is filled out because I follow this sector much more closely. But for semiconductors, I, I don't, you know, it's not my, it's not my field, you know, and to, to be, to be able to keep on top of one field is hard enough, let alone two or three or four, it's basically impossible. But I like learning new things and I like helping you guys out. So I try my best to, to do that. But I also am not going to pretend I'm a semiconductor expert. I know a little bit. I used to work at some tech hedge funds. So I, I've gotten exposure to semiconductors over the years. But I would be mistaken if I told you that, oh, you know, I, I can tell you everything about how fabs are designed and how, what it takes to, to you know, uh, look at the back end and front end of semiconductors and the relationship between Intel and ASML and applied materials and, you know, who's a customer for who and who designs chips for who and all that stuff. I don't, I don't know. I can tell you all that stuff about in pharma. Isn't it interesting? Texas Instruments is also bigger than Intel now. Intel's really falling apart. We are an industry leader, man. They were the industry leader by far. There's nobody even close. Have a positive effect on business society and the planet. It's always funny when these really big companies that used to be even bigger they're still really focused on ESG because they they're they still have that shadow of the former self. Nvidia doesn't talk like that. Nvidia's like, yeah, we're we're here to make money, man. <laughs> man, we don't care about ESG. All right, so they have CCG. I think that's Client Computing Group. Decreased 23 percent. DCAI. I have no idea. I think it's Data Center. Decreased fifteen percent. And Nex increased eleven percent. Results were impacted by an uncertain macro environment with slowing consumer demand, inflation, and interest rates, level of uncertainty with our customers. It's interesting, you know, the GDP, I'm trying to see if there's a, a good relationship with GDP, and I should probably graph that. 20% discount's not enough. No ESG in my, in my valuation. All right, uh, CCG was down on lower notebook and desktop volume, while notebook and desktop ASPs were higher. DCI server volume decrease led by enterprise customers, tempering purchases, reduced inventories, and a softening data center market. I thought the data center market was the only market that was doing well for like cloud, but I guess, I don't know. Server ASPs decreased due to customer product mix. Next revenue increased primarily due to Ethernet ASPs and increased demand for 5G products. This is their, NEX is like their networking business. I think it's probably smaller, the smallest business though. And we expect it to extend into 2023. Oh my gosh. Okay, so the product roadmap is one of the most important things in semiconductors, and it's often a little tricky, but I guess it's the 12th gen HX or Intel Core HX. And semiconductor experts, okay, Alder Lake, they be codenamed their processor sets. They have Sapphire Rapids. Raptor Lake and Ponte Vecchio. You gotta, you gotta wonder when X eighty six dies, right? It's uh, the eighty eighty six, and of course three eighty six, four eighty six. Maybe it'll never die. Here's the trailing five years. You can see quite a bit of cash flow. So it looks like twenty twenty two is definitely a cyclical slowdown. That hopefully represents the trough for them, but it may not, right? Yeah, the Apple, uh, Apple. Is a serious competitor now in, in this stuff. Obviously, they don't make products for clients. Laptop GPUs and high performance desktop GPUs, A7 series, Intel Arc. So, this is their attempt to, uh, I guess, get into NVIDIA's business. A little late. CCG Notebook, CCG Desktop, um, Notebook, 18.8 billion. Desktop, 10.7 billion. So I guess you know, it's still PC, very much a PC server heavy company, which makes sense, I guess. 
So that's uh, 33 billion? 31.7, okay. So that's half the company roughly is uh, client computing. So that's not servers, that's just PCs for people. It's about half the business, CCG. And then I'm guessing servers are most of the second half. So here's data center and AI. Yeah, it's amazing to see their revenue go like this while NVIDIA's goes like that. But I don't want to belabor the point about Intel having a rough, rough decade. <laughs> Network and edge. So this is like a relatively new business for Intel that's doing a little better than kind of a bright spot. That's really it. Oh, Mobileye is, I thought they spun this thing out. Do they still own most of it maybe? Looks like they sold 6%, 6% of Mobileye. So it looks like they still own most of Mobileye. This is a bright spot as well. Pretty small though. Intel will be acquired? That'd be wild, right? I doubt it. I think somebody, the right management team will, will restore Intel to its prior glory, hopefully. It'd be sad if they got acquired. Wouldn't that be funny, NVIDIA? Yeah, we're just buying Intel, whatever. Oh, accelerated compute systems and graphics. Oof. This is a new business unit? Intel Foundry? How many business units do they have? Oh, they can make a comeback. They just, like you said, need to really simplify their, their company. I'm not sure they need to have all this stuff. They may want to sell networking, for example, really just focus on chips. I know that it's like they want to be a little bit NVIDIA, they want to be a little bit Taiwan Semi, they want to be a little bit AMD, like just, just be really good at one thing, I think. They thought they were really good at one thing and they lost their, their way. You can see this stuff is fairly intensive. It's a little boring. If investing was exciting, more people would do it and make more money. You have to plow through huge amounts of information. It can be a bit tedious, but you get used to it. Sometimes when a company acquires or whatever, disposes of a, another company, you gotta be careful that you're not looking at, you're assuming that growth or shrinking, shrinkage is organic or inorganic. Because obviously, you know, it can impact uh, what it looks like the growth rate is. A lot of slow growth companies use acquisitions to kind of make their growth look higher than it normally is. So here's what revenue growth for Intel looked like 2016 to 2022. 2022 looked like basically close to flat or, or according to the, the government at least. We try to like impose, superimpose GDP See if there's anything we can kind of glean from that. You can see the huge amount of buybacks Intel has done. They've gone from 5 billion shares outstanding to 4 billion shares outstanding. So pretty impressive. You can see how a little bit of revenue change can result in a gigantic cash flow change. You basically go from profitable to unprofitable very quickly. Okay, so over the last five years, Intel cash free cash flow has averaged 11 billion, which makes the stock look quote unquote really cheap based on the 11 times earnings. But I think they're saying that 2023 is not gonna be a good year. So let's take a look at the recent, the recent comments. Fourth quarter revenue is down 32%, wow. I'm guessing this is nanometers. So Intel 7 is the seven nanometer process is my guess. we're going in terms of uh, fabrication and wafer size, we go to less than one nanometer. I think there's a atom limit, right? <laughs> I think, uh, the width of an atom is like 0 0.1 nanometers, isn't it? An angstrom. I know this from my chemical simulation world. Okay, here's the guidance. 
Wow. 10 to 11 billion. Oof. 30% gross margin. Wow, what a stinker. They laid an egg. That's not a good run rate, right? Interesting they didn't give guidance for 2023. Intel, the great American shrinking company. All right, so Intel revenue is going to drop 40% next quarter. 40%? Intel's revenue is dropping 40% next quarter. I mean, it's been on that trajectory, right? But oh man, what a shadow of its former self. I don't even know how to value this, right? So what's the shape of Intel's recovery gonna be? Like, this, could this be like the worst year ever for this company? Can you imagine? This could be Intel's worst year ever. So why the drop in revenue is a good question. Basically what I think is happening, I'm sorry to turn this into the semiconductor hour, but basically what I think is happening is AMD and Nvidia have taken over a lot of their market as well as Apple. So let's look at AMD really briefly. AMD incorporated in 1969. Wow. I did not know that. The Xilinx deal. Did Xilinx close? Yeah, I think it closed. It closed like six months ago, maybe. It's weird because like, if you look at AMD and Nvidia, they're still relatively small players compared to Intel. And I have a Texas Instruments model, although those guys don't, aren't really apples to apples. So if you define the semiconductor market as these three companies, which obviously it's not that, Intel's share, market share of that, has been 80%, then 75, then 65, then 59. Oh, brutal. <laughs> Yeesh. Okay, and if it goes to 50 billion, that's even scarier. Because now you're looking at even less. Then what I want to do is next steps. I mean, the numbers are great and everything, but I'd like to look at the actual wafers, the product specs. You can't just pretend, you gotta do it IRL. You can't LARP as a semiconductor analyst. You gotta really, you gotta really get the, get that equipment. Do a little deposition. Get a clean room in the, in the crib. All right, so obviously AMD has killed, absolutely killed it, right? They've done even better than Nvidia. So something has got to change for Intel. Uh, I'm going to see if AMD reported Q4. I don't think so. 23.6. Wow. What a beast. Do they give guidance? I doubt they gave guidance, right? They gave first quarter, so down year over year. It looks like the simple story is AMD is just murdering Intel. <laughs> There's really no other way to put it. Right? These guys make the same fucking product. One of them has revenue going up a lot, one of them has revenue going down a lot. Not too much of this story. So the question is, when will that stop? And has this happened before? AMD's had like these fits and starts, and I don't know how they can out-research Intel with a budget that's like one-tenth of the size. Oh, okay, well this includes Xilinx, so we gotta be a little careful. Xilinx probably contributed most of that growth. So be a little careful there. Although they didn't close Xilinx for the full year, right? But the Xilinx deal made them a bigger company. Looks like it was almost all a stock deal. They don't have any debt. They don't much, 2467. Yeah, it looks like it was almost completely a stock deal. Looks like Intel and AMD are roughly the same market cap or enterprise value. Sad day, sad day. All right, so let's try to model what the future of Intel will look like. If anybody can do it, it's me. Let's go out to 2035. We're not gonna assume any cyclicality. We're gonna assume that the world exists without booms and busts. We're gonna assume that there's a steady growth in GDP. Before I do this, I want one more piece of data. Oh my gosh. Intel spent spending like 11 billion in R&D back then when AMD was planning its products with 5% of the spend and, and is gaining market share on them. Sad, pathetic, 
we're almost ready to start thinking about what could a share of Intel be worth? That's what we spent the last two hours preparing for this moment. Are you ready? Whoever asked me is probably long gone. You need a lot of patience when you work in finance. You gotta really be willing to, you know, ADHD is not your friend in this industry. You gotta be willing to sit here, think, plug, crunch, talk to people, get to the bottom of things. Wow, look at this. Over nine years, they had cash flow of 13 billion, almost fairly regularly. And then just had this enormous problem in 2022 and 2023. It'd make a lot of sense, right? These are also years of uninterrupted growth in the economy. Do I need to go back even a little more? Back to like a more of a recession type period? I think I might have to. Only take five more minutes. We've been here two hours, we might as well. Tech is funny, like in tech you need to know the next quarter. <laughs> That's why the insider traders love tech. You need to know what's going on next quarter before it happens. Because otherwise, you really can come up with a long-term thesis based on the technology, but you don't know if that thesis is on track or not. You could do some probabilistic weightings of like, okay, this is a, Theoretically a good opportunity, but if the quarters don't start working in your direction, it doesn't really matter what you project. That's why tech is very tricky. And you need to keep your ear to the ground and watch the quarterly reports like a hawk, because if something's going wrong, you gotta redefine your whole thesis. So tech requires the so-called channel checks, which are basically illegal if you do them the right way. You're asking people, well, how their how's the business going for Intel, or you like their chips, or do you not like their chips? And if they say no, you exit your investment, but basically you're kind of getting insider info. So I don't like that whole process of tech investing. All right, you can see that there was some volatility in their cash flow this year, 2006. 2008 will be really interesting. It's not the same in pharma, no. In pharma, you can bet on product trajectories, and they're much like less volatile quarter to quarter because you can't change the product attribute. You know, you don't get new product releases. You get one product release every 10 years. So that's a bit different. And you can, you can basically predict how well the product will do based on the product attributes. Whereas here, it's, it's really not that easy. You kind of have to see the sales with your own eyes, if that makes sense. So it looks like 2008, they didn't have much of a revenue decline. Uh, even though that was a very challenging year cyclically. Let's see if they were a lagging indicator in 2009 was rough for them. You know, 2008, 2009 were, were rough, but they weren't this rough. They weren't up 40%. They used to have 6.2 billion shares outstanding. Now they have, I think I remember when they had seven. Now they have four. Yeah, so the, the eight, 2008 recession didn't phase Intel. Semiconductor, um, cycle and the economic cycle aren't 100% overlap, I guess. So the semi-cycle right now is hitting this big bump, but you wouldn't know it if you talked to AMD. You would sort of know it if you talked to NVIDIA. They've had a big slowdown. And there's the boom in the cycle right back in 2010 to peak cash flows. So they have a business cycle and a market share cycle, like a product cycle, and they're at the trough of both, which is why it's like a perfect storm. And usually you want to buy stocks, right, when there's a perfect storm, because it can't get any worse. Although, there's no reason to think it can't get, it can't get worse for Intel. That's sort of what I'm saying about the directionality and, I guess, instant instantaneous rate of change, basically, for Intel. And for most of tech, but especially for semiconductors, you have that concept of like, you have to know how the business is doing right now. Like almost like a week to week thing to make sure that it's on track. Maybe there's some like savants who can see the technology and say, oh, they really have this advantage. But generally speaking, that's kind of not the way it works. Usually, no matter what the technology looks like, 
you sort of have to see the sales coming to fruition. So they had 15 million in, in cash flow, free cash flow back then, 2011. And that seemed like another cyclical top. And the quarterly reports are, are basically what those, I'm not a big fan of you doing graphs in Excel, but let's, this is an interesting data set. This is free cash flow for Intel. I just want you to see kind of like how different a semiconductor company's cash flow looks for most companies. Real big swings in net income. And this is something else, right? Unprecedented. All right, so let's let's take a stab at this. I'm gonna assume the semiconductor market grows at 5% per annum until 2035. That's not a crazy assumption, I think. I'm gonna assume that Intel's share of this market never recovers to 80%. It does kind of recover to 60, maybe 65%, let's say. That's really simple analysis. What happens if Intel gets back a little bit of its prior success? Doesn't have to get all of it back, just a little. Well, maybe half. Uh, let's say its margins, maybe don't go back to a peak of 65, but they go back to say, like a probabilistic deep value play in some ways. All right, we get a valuation of 200 billion for Intel. $50 a share, quite a lot more than 27. So could it be a deep value play? <sighs> Very lofty assumptions, yes, yes, yes. Um, if they make their comeback, a partial comeback. But again, it's, it's sort of fraught with that guesswork, but my guess is it, typically in, in, in this kind of investing, you have to make some probabilistic gamble, and I hate to gamble. And you don't have to gamble, right? The only you, you can gamble. Basically, assume Intel doesn't recover very much, but it can hold its own. I mean, they're still the sort of preferred chip customer. I mean, it's, their business is still, you know, uh, three times uh, in AMD. Let's make some simpler assumptions. I mean, if they don't recover, if they barely recover at all, you don't lose any money. So it, it seems like, I mean, it could certainly get worse. If things get worse for them, you will lose money. So the, the market basically assumes they make a very, very tepid recovery. And remember, they're in a cyclical trough and a product trough. So the, it's supposed to look like it's the worst right now. And it kind of thinks, yeah, I kind of think that, I kind of feel like, um, the market assuming they never recover seems like a, a, just doesn't seem like the right reality. They've never had margins this low. They've never had, yeah, I don't know. It, it's certainly possible that that's what happens. And again, I have to learn more about the industry, but it seems like a decent speculative long, you know, they have to recover just a, just a little bit of their prior success and the stock is doubled. But people said the same thing about IBM and all these other companies. But again, you have to think about it probabilistically, not as like you're holding a gun to your head. You know, is this worth 1% of your portfolio? Yeah, probably. That's right too, Freddie. Freddie's right that destabilization in Taiwan would, would make a big, big difference for, for Intel too. And they do have a new strategy, right? They kind of want to do the foundry stuff. Again, that, that could actually be a bigger risk for them than anything else. That, that, that actually might hurt them. <laughs> Um, but if they execute it, there's some optionality there. Um, let me share these models with you guys. So if you want to pull them up yourselves, you can go to my GitHub. If you haven't used GitHub, it's a really great file sharing tool. Um, it's used for so-called version control and computer programming, but which is what I predominantly use it for. But I also, um, 
use it to share these files. So you can just go to my GitHub. It's uh, github.com forward slash martinshkrelly forward slash models. 